thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. We will get started with tonight's webinar in just a few minutes. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We will get started with tonight's webinar in just a few minutes. Thank you again for joining us and we will get started in just one minute. Thank you. Hi, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Jen Elting, and I am part of the communications and community relations team here at the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. Welcome to tonight's Zoom webinar for the Doan Brook Restoration near Horseshoe Lake Project. Near New Horseshoe Lake Park project. Tonight's presentation is being recorded and it will be available later on at neorsd.org slash Doanbrook. If you have questions for our panelists, please utilize the Q&A feature within Zoom. I will be watching the questions, answering some as they arise, and saving others for the Q&A period at the end of tonight's webinar. Once a question is answered via this feature, the question and answer will be made available to everyone. If you don't feel comfortable using the Q&A feature, you can also send an email to ask us at neorsd.org. That's A S K U S at N E O R S D dot O R G. Our partner Land Studio is launching a survey about this project, and the survey is available online at N E O R S D dot org slash Joan Brook. We will share more information about the survey later on in tonight's presentation. Presenting this evening from the Sewer District are Matt Sharver. Deputy Director of Watershed Programs, and Janet Popielski, Stormwater Program Manager. Also here to answer questions are Project Manager, Dennis Zaharia, and Director of Watershed Programs, Frank Greenland. You can meet and talk to more of our staff and the design team about this project and our regional stormwater management work at Horseshoe Lake Park this Saturday, August 27th, from 10.30 a.m. until 1 o'clock p.m. Details about this event are available online at neorsd.org slash Doanbrook. Again, please feel free to send questions my way using the Q&A feature. And thank you again for joining us tonight. And I will pass this along to my colleagues, Janet and Matt. Good evening, Good evening everyone. And uh, thank you for joining our first public forum uh, on the Doanbrook restoration near Horseshoe Lake project. Uh, within the cities of Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights. 
Um, following these uh, brief opening remarks, we'll be providing information uh, to begin this first public forum engagement opportunity with the community. Uh, our goal is to be inclusive as, as possible, um, fully transparent uh, in, with our communication, and, and our communication uh, will be timely, uh, two-way, uh, truthful, and thoughtful. Uh, Don't Brook, uh, which is at the center of the Parklands uh, landscape, uh, is an important water resource for our communities in many ways. Don't Brook is, a regional, is also a regional stormwater asset under the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District's Regional Stormwater Management Program. And that is why the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District is here working collaboratively with the cities of Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights, and the city of Cleveland to ensure that we as a region appropriately address the failing dam at Horseshoe Lake uh, effectively and, and restore Doan Brook uh, within a well-defined uh, publicly engaged process that's meaningful uh, and uh, fosters participation that helps formulate an appropriate transformation of, of our landscape here. Uh, water resource management uh, comes with great challenges. Uh, the changing weather patterns uh, that we're experiencing locally, uh, observing nationally, uh, clearly highlight uh, those challenges. Uh, and we here at the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District uh, take great pains under our regional stormwater management program uh, to approach those challenges with a watershed-based um, approach to solving erosion, flooding, and water quality issues, not only along Dome Brook, but all of our streams within our service area. And that's important because we need to continue to protect our water resources uh, for our communities uh, and for one of the world's greatest resources uh, that's here on our doorstep, Lake Erie. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass to Janet Polpiowski. She is our stormwater program manager and she will begin to provide more detailed information on our ensuing project. Thank you, Matt. So tonight, the study area that we'll be going over is just one portion of the much larger Dome Brook watershed. Dome Brook is a direct tributary to Lake Erie that flows through the cities of Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights, and Cleveland before draining into the lake at the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. You might also know this as Dyke 14. The study area for this project is located in what we call the Upper Dome Brook Watershed, and it's highlighted right there on the map. And I'll go into this area in more detail in just a moment. But first, the lower reach of Dome Brook begins at about Euclid Avenue and flows northwest through University Circle, where it's, where it's actually underground in a series of culverts beginning at Ambler Park before emerging near the Art Museum. It then continues to the cultural gardens along Martin Luther King Boulevard before going underground again at I-90 and then through the nature preserve to the lake. It's these areas along Martin Luther King Boulevard and University Circle that have, that have experienced repeated flooding over the years due to storm events which overwhelm the existing stormwater infrastructure. So the upper Dome Brook watershed or the drainage area upstream of University Circle is approximately 6,005 acres, and it's where four artificial lakes are located that were created by the damming of the stream. Green and Marshall Lakes, which are labeled on the screen there, are located on the south branch of Dome Brook. Horseshoe Lake, which is also known as Upper Lake, sits at the confluence of the middle and the north branches. All of these come together right upstream of Lower Lake. So as I mentioned, the portion of the Dome Brook watershed that drains to University Circle is approximately 6,005 acres, but only about 1,000 of those acres or less than 20% of that area drains through Horseshoe Lake. By contrast, the flow that drains to University Circle passes through Lower Lake. By, by contrast, 50% of the flow that drains to University Circle passes through Lower Lake, including the flow from Green, Marshall, and Horseshoe. So Lower Lake is what we call a point of control in the watershed. The same can't be said for Horseshoe Lake. Because it has a much smaller drainage area further upstream in the watershed, it does not have the same benefits. 
which is why the sewer district's recommendation is to remove the lower lake dam, but also retain, or sorry, remove the Horseshoe Lake Dam, but also retain Lower Lake. The Lower Lake Dam will need to be replaced to meet current regulations, and the district will begin that design next year. First, though, I'd like to take, or right now, I'd like to take a moment and talk about the different types of flooding that we're concerned about under the Regional Stormwater Management Program. The first type is the one that I mentioned in University Circle and along Martin Luther King Boulevard. It occurs during storm events from the lack of stormwater management, development in the Donebrook watershed, and the significant amount of impervious surface. The second type of flooding that can occur that we're concerned about in our program is due to a dam failure, which would release a large quantity of water, which may result in the loss of life and could cause significant property damage. For Horseshoe Lake, that impact would begin immediately downstream and continue to University Circle. It's because of these potential impacts that Horseshoe Lake Dam is classified as a class one or a high hazard dam by the state of Ohio. And this brings us to the immediate problem that we face today. Horseshoe Lake Dam is a 170 year old dam in extremely poor condition and out of compliance with state of Ohio dam safety regulations and modern design standards for a class one or high hazard dam. The pictures on the screen are of sinkholes that were found on the masonry portion of the dam called the spillway, which is where water is intended to safely pass from the lake down to the stream below. Sinkholes such as these have been, seen, have been seen many times in recent years and led the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to order the lake drained. The ones in the photos were found under the observation deck on top of the spillway after the concrete was saw cut. The largest void was nearly seven feet deep. Sinkholes such as these were continuing to form even after the lake was drained because it continued to impound water during storm events. It's important to mention that although we can attempt to fill these, sink these sinkholes, they're typically just the tip of the iceberg. We don't know how many more exist that we can't see, any one of which could cause the dam to fail anywhere along its 630 foot length, extending from North Park to South Park. To lessen the severity, if the dam were to fail when the lake fills up, the city of Shaker Heights undertook a project to partially breach the dam and build an auxiliary spillway. Although these measures have been taken, there is still a risk to the community and the environment as long as the dam is in place. The removal of the class one dam and restoration of Dome Brook through this area achieves the goals of the Regional Stormwater Management Program, addresses the state of Ohio regulatory requirements, forever eliminates the risks associated with a large high hazard dam, greatly reduces the operation and maintenance requirements within this reach of Dome Brook by restoring natural stream functions such as vegetated floodplains and meanders, and also provides a practical and permanent solution to sediment that accumulates in an artificial lake. The sewer, the sewer district recognized that in order to design a project that removes the dam and restores the stream within such a cherished area, we needed to ensure that we selected the right team. So we undertook a national search for a landscape architect led design team to see us through this project. We went about this in a way which we've never done before at the sewer district by not only searching for a landscape architecture firm instead of just an engineering firm, but also by inviting 14 observers from Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights to join us for the interviews. We also enlisted the help of Land Studio, known for their great work on public spaces in Cleveland to aid us through the consultant selection process, as well as the design process. The result is that we've assembled a team to explore the park planning opportunities and the technical complexities associated with this dam removal and stream restoration. With us tonight is Matt Langan, the project manager with the nationally renowned firm Stimson Landscape Architects, along with other members of the design team. We're happy to have him and his team with us tonight, and you can also meet them on Saturday at Horseshoe Lake Park. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Matt. Great, thank you, Janet, and welcome everyone to what we are hopeful is the first of many opportunities that we'll have together to discuss and imagine a vision for this project. 
As Janet mentioned, my name is Matt Langen. I'm a landscape architect and the technical director at Stimson, which is a small detail-oriented landscape architecture studio based in greater Boston. Personally, I have worked on public realm projects across the country while also having the pleasure of consistently working in Northeast Ohio for the better part of the last decade. Greater Cleveland, in a sense, has become a second home for me, uh, which has allowed me and my team to develop great professional working relationships with an outstanding group of technical consultants and engineers that we've engaged to support our effort on this project. And you'll be hearing from a lot of them tonight and uh, in future engagement opportunities. Before we dig in, I'm gonna hand it off first to my principal in charge, Glenn Valentine at Stimson, to talk a little bit more about Stimson's approach to designing in the public realm across the country. Thanks, Matt. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming to this meeting. We're really excited to talk to you tonight. To explain to you a little bit about the core values of Stimson, we're gonna just run through a couple of quick projects here that we think most clearly illustrate our values. We work on projects, um, as Matt mentioned, we're a small firm outside of Boston, Massachusetts, but we work on projects across the country, ranging from uh, large public parks to pocket parks to even residences. This is an example of a large public park in Texas, in San Antonio, Texas. This is Hardberger Park. And the reason I start with this project is the image in the upper left is um, the, the image of the visitor center that first greets you when you come to Hardberger Park. And immediately adjacent to that walk where you see the two people is a large stormwater swale. You see that kind of grassy swale running next to them. Um, and that's put it there. That's the thing we want you to recognize first when you come to the site. We want you to recognize the native plants and celebrate the native ecology of the site. And that's what planted in that stormwater swale. But more importantly, maybe than that, is that that swale extends all the way to the parking area. And when you get out of your car and you start walking into the park, that's the first thing that you're greeted with. This, um, this planting of, of native plants that gathers and cleans and infiltrates the stormwater from the parking area. And in this way, it begins to explain not only the native plants and ecology, but your place as a human in that system and your impact on that system. Thanks. The second project here is uh, Florence Griswold. This is in Connecticut. And here also we worked with ecologists and scientists on the restoration of the river corridor you see on the, on the left, very carefully bringing that back to life. But we also work very carefully with art historians on this particular historic property because this site is the home of American Impressionism. And history is another key value for Stimson. And here working with um, the, the historians, we were able to recreate some of not only this landscape, but the historic views that are captured in the paintings in the museum, just off the, um, the screen here. And give you a sense not only of the landscape, but uh, what it used to look like and, and how it's been restored today to that condition. Next one. The next park, Ferris Park in Lawrence is, the reason we show this one is it's a, a post-industrial site. There's a, a foundry that was here for many years and this large mound of post-industrial slag or um, casting sand was left over from that industrial process. And when we took on this project, we had to deal with all of this sediment on site. It couldn't be moved off. It had to be managed and um, carefully designed in such a way to be economical and really serve an important purpose to the park. And here we, we mounted it up. You can see this section on the bottom created this large earthen mound as the centerpiece of the park and created an accessible walkway that spirals around the park and gets you up to the top. From there, you get a view not only of the adjacent riverway, but of the entire community and really a transformational kind of experience for people visiting this site. Next. And lastly, I'm gonna show you Kunamesic River Park in Falmouth. This is a park very similar to Doan Brook in many ways. Um, 
here, the park, before we started working on it, was a series of cranberry bogs and low dams or impoundments that captured and turned this into a, a regulated and um, productive landscape, really a, a kind of industrial landscape. Working with stream restorationists and ecologists and scientists, we were able to restore this river corridor and this entire flood, in flood entire floodplain. And then we created a boardwalk, which you see on the right-hand side, which passes directly through the middle of the restored river valley and gives you kind of close-up views of this restored ecology. And also on the left, an elevated curved kind of bridge that gives you a view of the entire floodplain and gives you a, a sense of how this restored ecology all works together. I'm going to pass it over to Matt to talk a little bit about some of our uh, preliminary ideas about uh, planning and implementation. Great. Thank you, Glenn. Um, so on the screen here, you can see on the very top of the screen, you can see a schedule of the design process. And we are at the very beginning of that design process. And we're at the beginning of the pre-design process. Um, and we want to make sure that it's clear from the outset that our design team and our client are committed to making this a community-centered process. We want you to be involved in the outcome of this design process. While we do have a detailed scope that we have signed up to carry out, uh, we, as, as the designers, bring no agenda or ego to the table. It's our responsibility as designers of the public realm to engage, to listen, to ask questions, and to build on the feedback that we receive from the community and our project stakeholders. We plan to take your feedback combined with our own inventory and analysis of the site, some of which you'll see tonight, to begin to craft a series of design alternatives that are both visionary and grounded. We encourage everyone to participate in this process, to be aspirational, aspirational in the planning effort, but to also be realistic about the capacity for fundraising, philanthropy, and long-term stewardship of this important regional resource and beloved community space. In these early stages, I wanna make it clear that there is no design, there is no cost estimate, and there's no assumptions being made about what's most appropriate for you or your public space. We're simply asking for you to participate in this process with us, and we hope that you can see the opportunity is great. We believe that together, we can imagine a brighter, healthier, and more sustainable future for the Doan Brook and the surrounding parklands. Along the way, we hope to garner enthusiasm and support to identify funding, philanthropy, and stewardship mechanisms to help realize our collective vision that we imagine together. There's great and ample precedence of urban parklands across the country that have been realized and or rehabilitated with the support of partnerships, conservancies, and organizations that bought into some great planning ideas resulting in the implementation and long-term stewardship of those spaces. And they range from you know, the very well-known Central Park Conservancy in New York to the Lincoln Park Conservancy in Chicago and closer to home, the recently constructed parklands of Floyd Fork in Louisville, Kentucky, and even closer to home, the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. And so again, we are at the very beginning of this process. And while we don't have uh, funding identified for everything that you'll see and everything that we think about together, um, we're certain that we will have that in place as we go through this process. I also want to make a statement here about memory. Um, you know, we acknowledge that change is hard. Um, but, and we know that we're working here specifically in an area that has a very strong physical and or emotional attachment for many of you. We as designers enter into a new context every time we start a new project. And we promise to work hard to understand your connections to this place and we'll be sympathetic and sensitive throughout the design and construction process of that connection. So tonight we have a few things planned um, to, to update you all on as we begin this community conversation. I'm gonna walk through our goals and objectives that we've established for the project. Some of my design team members are gonna help summarize our site analysis that we've developed over the past couple months. We will identify some opportunities 
to begin the design conversation with you to get you to start reacting to some um, ideas and images about park character and programming. And then we'll finish up by identifying a series of upcoming engagement events and have a brief Q&A at the end of the uh, evening tonight. To zoom back out for a second and look at the entire Donebrook corridor, I think it's important to know here, and, and this is probably already well known by most of you, but Donebrook has always been a magnet for biodiversity, habitat, and human development. It was the hunting ground for thousands of years to the indigenous cultures of Ohio before European settlement and has since been continually affected by pressures of development, uh, despite the historic, heroic, and visionary protection of the corridor in the last 150 years or so. Despite all of that, it remains a magnet for your communities and for all of the great educational and cultural institutions that are drawn towards the Donebrook corridor that you can see here on this image. And so as we zoom in and start to look at our project area in particular, I wanna call your attention to our study area, which is defined by Lee Road on the west, North Park Boulevard, Park Drive, and South Park Boulevard. That's the study area that we are studying as part of this planning process. We'd like to invite you all to think about your memories and experiences in that area and around Horseshoe Lake Park that small, loved, well-maintained, and well-used six-acre peninsula that you see highlighted on the screen that's been created by the north and middle branches of Doan Brooks. There you can see the north branch and the middle branch that confluence in the old lake bed. We'd like you to think about your memories and your experiences in that place, but also we ask you to imagine the opportunities that come if we think of the park as the full 60 acre study area. Um, if you think about this as your park, we think we can achieve a myriad of goals, including but not limited to ecology, landscape performance, historic interpretation, and passive recreation improvements throughout the entire study area. And so we want everyone to think big with us about what the opportunities could be here. As we shift into our goals and objectives, we've established a series of goals with that 60 acre study area in mind. So the first goal is to develop a comprehensive landscape plan, which is a planning document that will integrate ecological, cultural, and recreational amenities into that plan. And it will also incorporate the next three goals, the restoration of the stream corridors, both the north branch and the middle branch of Doan Brook. And as we're enhancing, um, as we're creating those stream restorations, we're gonna enhance the ecological sustainability in the floodplain along those corridors. To do that, we have to manage a lot of sediment that's in the way that's been accumulating in the lake basin for the last 170 years. And then we have to remove the dam so that we're no longer impounding water and creating that risk for the communities. I'm gonna talk about each of these goals in a little bit more detail. In our development of a landscape plan, uh, like I mentioned, we are going to focus on the study area that's highlighted here, bounded by those streets. But we're also gonna look further afield, both downstream and upstream, to take cues from the dynamic natural forces on the corridor to help us understand what's possible in restoring the stream connections through Horseshoe Lake Park. We also know, and we're working really hard to um, be aware of, understand, and then interpret all the multifaceted historical, natural, and cultural legacies impacting both the ecology and your use of the site. We plan to only recommend design and park elements that are informed by community needs and interests. And we don't know what those are yet because we haven't asked those questions. And so we invite you all to let us know what you think is the most appropriate use in this study area so that we can integrate it into the complex mixture of all the other ingredients that we need to uh, provide design solutions for. We're going to repair some of the connections that have been lost over time. You'll see the obvious ones like the, the walkway across the dam that was um, severed for the emergency breach and you'll see historic pathways and circulation routes that no longer exist today. 
And no matter what we ultimately put in this planning document, we need to make sure that it's both visionary and grounded because we need this to be something achievable um, by all the partners on the project. In our effort to restore the stream corridors through the impoundment area, and when I say impoundment area, that simply refers to the footprint of the old lake. And you can see down here in this key plan, the footprint of the old lake, and we've cut a section across that. And this section on top here shows that north branch of Doan Brook. So um, North Park Boulevard would be just off your screen here on the left. Um, and the park, uh, Horseshoe Lake Park proper, the peninsula is on the right hand side of the screen here. And what you can see is that the valley created by Doan Brook historically is quite wide. And there was a lot of floodplain for that stream to come out of its banks and flood the floodplain over time and then uh, recede back into its banks. That ability has been lost by the, um, the fact the lake was constructed in the 1800s. And since that time, that lake has been filling up with sediment. Um, but what we need to do in our stream restoration process is take a typical section based on the flows that we understand are coming through Doan Brook and reinsert that into this wide valley allowing for the stream to flow during normal periods and for the stream to come up above its banks and access a floodplain that do doesn't have access to today. What's interesting about this is that that stream restoration is just a very small piece of the valley that's created. And so there's lots of opportunity on either sides of the stream restoration project and also on either side of Horseshoe Lake Park to reimagine that vast acreage of space that needs to be reinterpreted. As we start to develop a stream restoration series of alternatives, we acknowledge that it can take on a series of different characters. So on the screen here, you can see a couple projects that our team has worked on and a couple other local projects where um, the character of the stream restoration can feel very naturalistic, like here at Beecher's Brook or down at the bottom where Glenn's standing on the banks there at Mill Creek, not too far away. Even downstream from our project at the Cleveland Museum of Art, you can see this is the main branch of the Doan Brook, a much larger water body uh, which a, with a lot more water coming through this corridor where we have reinforced slopes um, and, and, and stream banks to make sure that we're managing the erosion uh, of the stream as it makes its way down towards Lake Erie. And then you can see some other more constructed edges to the stream. And so we'd like to invite you to start to think about what you think is the most appropriate character as we restore the streams through the um, Horseshoe Lake Park, Parklands area. One of the biggest challenges ahead of us is figuring out a way to manage the waterway sediment. That's that 12 to 15 foot deep or more of sediment that has accumulated in the lake bed over the last 150, 170 years. Uh, that is a lot of sediment and to put it into context, it's about 60 Olympic sized swimming pools full of sediment. And if I did my math correctly, it's about, it was, it's equivalent to filling the atrium of the Cleveland Museum of Art two and a half times over. It's a lot of material and it's very expensive to remove from the site. And so we have to start to think creatively about how we manage this sediment. And we think that there's opportunity to manage that sediment on site. We're doing a series of tests with of that sediment right now to understand the chemical and physical properties of it and how we can amend it to, to reuse it in some ways on site. And that's critically important as we go to our next goal of removing the dam. The dam needs to be re removed for those safety and risk issues that were mentioned at the top of the presentation. And that is what's holding back all this sediment. And so we need to make sure that we mitigate the risk of the watershed during and after construction of, of uh, keeping that sediment in place and managing stream flows during construction and after construction. And the, when we talk about dam removal, there's a couple of key components to this, this particular project. There's the earthen embankment, which is about 630 feet wide. It spans from North Park Boulevard on the left-hand side to South Park Boulevard on the right-hand side much of that earth and embankment likely will have to go so that the streams can flow 
and it's not impounding water uh, like the dam did uh, when it was constructed. The emergency breach that was recently constructed on the south side of the dam will also be removed. And then there's the historic spillway, that great masonry structure in the center of the dam. We imagine there are scenarios where the historic spillway can remain in place as a relic and a memorial to the um, historic use of the site um, by the Shakers and others. And so we don't have an answer yet because we haven't started the design process, but we know that there's gonna be a series of alternatives for um, what the dam removal looks like. Um, and, and we're certain that as we go through those alternatives, we'll, we'll do it in the safest way possible for the communities. And one of the challenges of the dam removal, if I just go back for a second, is to reconnect the streams, the north branch and the middle branch down to the, to the main branch down here, there's about 30 feet of grade change. And there's a lot of sediment in the way of doing that. And so we feel like there's going to be a series of scenarios where we have to introduce grade control or vertical grade changes in those stream corridors to get the water from one level down to that lower level. And again, this could take on a series of characters. It could be more naturalistic, like you see here down by the Cleveland Museum of Art, where there's um, um, riffles and, 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 and boulders in the way to disguise that vertical grade change that you can see the water coming down right through there. Um, but it could also take on a more architectural character, so like some of these other examples. And so we don't know where these would be yet or what ultimately they will look like, but we're pretty certain based on our understanding of the site that there will be opportunity for uh, grade control measures to be introduced. And they may be um, part of strategies to allow uh, folks to cross the stream in multiple locations. And so as we transition here to our site analysis summary, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Roy Larrick to talk uh, briefly about in a, an abridged history of the corridor and, and human occupation in the corridor. Roy. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, fellow lovers of Doan Brook. I am here to say that restoring Doan at Horseshoe presents concrete means to preserve local history. The pre-planning team is therefore engaged in a rigorous site history analysis. The goal is to identify historical resources to be preserved during the long term of the project. <clears throat> Excuse me. My four slides will show known resources. As more historical features come to light, they will be published for review. Based on the complete survey, you, the public, can help build preservation priorities. In the meantime, online surveys, like the one opening tonight, are your means to make historical preservation desires known. Native Americans hunted in the Doan Valley uh, for many centuries, as Matt mentioned. Theirs was a time when humans lived in relative harmony with nature. Little refuse was produced. Years ago, a couple of stone spear points were found in the Doan Gorge rock shelters, but there is no recorded prehistory from the project area. Current research, therefore, focuses upon four more recent periods. First, as indicated by the red square on the left map, is the Brief Connecticut Land Company survey of 1796 to 1801. Moses Cleveland's men were charged with enumerating timber resources along lot lines, such as those in red. We are pursuing the surveyor tree data that's archived at the Western Reserve Historical Society. Knowing the actual trees of the local native forest can help guide reforestation at future horseshoe. Second, as indicated by the small green rectangle on the left map, are the early milling activities of the Russell family. Millwright Elijah Russell, brother of Shaker Colony founder Ralph Russell, built the first installation, a sawmill just east of Lee Road. The 1810s mill predated the Shaker's 1820 presence on Lee Road by a dozen years. Third is the brief period of Shaker woolen milling, about 1850 to 1870. Our working hypothesis is that the center family operation evolved from the Russell sawmill. Fourth, is the development of the Shaker Parklands from 1893 to the early 1930s. Turn your attention to slide right, top and bottom photographs. The bottom shot shows the Horseshoe Lake Spillway as totally rebuilt in the 1930s. What may appear to be Shaker is not always Shaker. Now bear with me 
as I identify key historical features using several maps. This base map shows the difference in bedrock geology between lower and upper lakes. At map left, the Berea Sandstone Terrace provided a firm foundation for the lower lake dam. Upstream, the Cuyahoga Shale Slope was lesser rock. The soft substrate may contribute to the long-term deterioration of Horseshoe Dam. This map shows the Russell Mill Pond that predated Horseshoe by as much as 30 years. The lake tail, the upper end, lay downstream of the Horseshoe Confluence. Note the mill race that extends westward from the lakehead to rejoin Doan Brook west of Lee. This area needs survey. Next, and uh, look to the upper right map. In 1894, landscape architects Ernest Bowditch and Charles Pratt designed boulevards to link Horseshoe Lake with Lake Erie at Gordon Park. This is the origin of North and South Park Boulevards, now 125 years old. At Horseshoe, a horse carriage or Model T could cross the ravine just downstream of the dam. In 1947, a major flood washed out the crossing bridge. The roadway was abandoned. Nevertheless, the current elevation map shows that the crossing dike survives on the north side of the brook. Presently unused, the dike could be rehabilitated to serve the Parklands Trail Network. The current elevation map also shows unnatural narrowings of the ravine downstream of Horseshoe. Might these be remnants of the Russell Dam? Time will tell, we've not surveyed this area. Finally, at lower left, the blue line on the contour map shows the surviving woolen mill, mill race. This is the channel, man-made in 1852, to carry water from the dam to the woolen mill water wheel. The surviving feature extends for nearly 800 feet between the dam and Lee Road. In my mind, the mill race is the priority feature for conservation. In sum, the site history analysis is producing results. I encourage local history groups to review the emerging data as the basis for public historical preservation plans plans. Uh, the pre-planning pre team will entertain public submissions in early 2023. Turning to Saturday's open house, I'll have the geology and history tent on the south side of the dam. I'm looking to have productive conversations with many of you. Talk to me. Ask the hard questions. Say what you'd like to see conserved. And we'll go walk down to see that mill race. Thank you. And now I present uh, Camila Campos, Associate Landscape Architect with Stimson. Camila will address current amenities on the project site. Camila, take it over. Thanks, Roy. Um, when doing our research, we found four historical plans for Horseshoe Lake. Uh, this is a graphic representation of the Bowditch and Pratt plan from 1894. And on the top right is the original. This plan positioned Horseshoe Lake as the anchor for the parks and parkways uh, network to Lake Erie. It emphasized the connection to the water at the north tip, yeah, the canoe landing. Uh, in Dash Magenta, um, this is the first instance of access to the park from the central driveway, and it remains today. And this is the entry drive as we see it today. This is the Pitkin and Mott uh, plan from 1932. It was commissioned by the Shaker Lakes Garden Club as part of a beautification program. The intent here was to allow all the garden clubs to select their own sites to develop around the lake. Uh, this plan shows a lot of care to select views and vistas uh, throughout the park. And there was an emphasis on flowering trees and a diversity of experiences, like the paths for the aquatic um, plants. There's a picnic grove uh, and flowering gardens. The different colors illustrate different tree species. Today, what remains um, of this plan are the, pa the path across uh, the dam, the remnants of the beach and the park. Yeah, that one, the remnants of the beach and uh, the park character at the point. And then on the lower left is a plan commissioned by the Village Garden Club in 1980. And this one highlights the vista, the, the vista as well as the flowering trees. Uh, and these are early shots of um, the Village Garden Club's garden. And you can see here the clear views through the flowering trees to the lake and the lawn. 
Uh, this is a noise plan from 1940. It was commissioned by the city of Cleveland for the Shaker Lakes Park. Uh, it emphasized the separation of path uses with an extensive network of bridle paths. So that's the dashed yellow lines. And then the solid yellow lines are walking paths. And then the red uh, squares are bridges. So the paths near the water and bridges crossing the river were integral uh, to the design. So here again, there's a connection to the water. So in the dashed magenta, you can see where um, the, the beach and the small fountain are today. Uh, possibly even the trails, the bridled path trails that are seen here are the trails that exist today. Um, and these are images of the existing condition of these, this beautiful um, remnant. So you can see the stone walkway through the grove in this, the center uh, top. And then the lower center, there's the stone stairway to the beach and then the beach overlook on the right uh, and the details of the splash pad. And now uh, we're going to talk about the connections and access to the park. So this is the Lake to Lakes Trail um, that connects Lake Erie to Horseshoe Lake. And we see Hor the Horseshoe Lake Park as an anchor for, for this trail. We'd like to reinforce that. And this is the existing parking on site. So we do think the existing parking is adequate. There are 261 parking spaces on street with three ADA parking spaces in, in the park. Uh, however, most of these spaces actually do not have um, accessible sidewalks. Next. Uh, this is our cycling, the cycling infrastructure. So North Park Boulevard has extensive bicycle infrastructure. There's the solid magenta lines um, are the on-street bike lanes. The yellow line is the Lake to Lakes Trail. And then the blue line is a desire line that exists today where essentially the Lakes to Lakes Trail cannot, does not connect into the park. On South Park Boulevard, the dashed magenta is a shared lane, and then the solid magenta is a bike lane. So it's very fragmented, and there is no direct connection to the Nature Center or to Attleboro Station. This is the pedestrian circulation, and in the same way, the uh, dark blue lines are showing desire lines that exist today but are not formal. The, the magenta stars are curb cuts and you can see that on, on the edges of Horseshoe Lake there isn't really direct connection to any to uh, Attleboro Road. Um, again at Park Drive and South Park Boulevard there isn't a connection. There isn't a connection at uh, where the, the dam path is either across the street. And then of course at the nature center, there's really no curb cut or accessible um, paths. And then this is a transfer, transit infrastructure. The blue line is the Shaker Heights rapid transit that it runs every 15 minutes. And the Horseshoe Lake is not a nine minute walk. However, uh, there isn't really any um, like mentioned before, a, a direct curb cut that makes, so this path is basically inaccessible for a wheelchair. And that is it. Glenn, I'll, over to you for the environmental investigation. Great, thanks Camila. So, um, and while we've been doing these investigations into history and access and historic plans that you've just seen from Roy and Camila, we have also started our environmental investigation of the project area. This is a, one of our preliminary diagrams that shows basic character types on the site. Um, and they range really from, um, as you know, open marshlands to mature uh, forest lands in, in some of the ravine valleys. One, one element I'll point or one character zone I'll point out on this diagram is this bright green color, which represents lawn. And you can see the six acre, roughly six acre lawn area in Horseshoe Lake proper. But you can also see the bright green areas all around the perimeter of the site, which are much larger than the six acres of the park. And as this project and the design process advances, that's one thing we like to look at. What is the character of the perimeter of the site and what should be the maintenance requirements and 
practice to maintain that area. Next slide. And here's a diagram that shows some of the plants that make up these different character zones uh, on the site. And as I mentioned, we, there's, there's wonderful mature trees and uh, wide areas of uh, open wetlands throughout the site. And as all of you know, there's really a collection of wonderful canopy trees throughout the entire area. Next slide. And we have some images of those trees and those plant communities. Uh, for instance, in the lower left-hand corner, you see an example of one of the mature northern red oaks, which dominate the woodlands all around the perimeter of Horseshoe Lake Park proper, and really are an incredible collection of, of trees. And on that lower row of plants, uh, three images over, you see American sycamores. And it's hard to see, but there's mat down at the bottom. They're actually huge trees as well. And they are the dominant trees or a very distinctive part of the uh, stream corridor between the dam and Lee Road and, and really give that part of the site a very distinctive character. Next. There are also large areas of this of the site in the project area that are uh, have been overrun by invasive species, as many of you know. And you can see the most important thing to note in this diagram is that most of those invasive species, and here the yellow and the orange are the, the light yellow and the orange species are the ones that I'm referring to, have taken over the impoundment area of the former lake. And as this project develops, that's one area we will definitely be manipulating, as Matt mentioned, by handling all the sediment and restoration of the stream corridor. And a key goal of this project and of this entire process will be to remove those invasive species from these areas and restore a ecology and native plants throughout that area and throughout this um, entire project and the entire project area of the site. We've also been thinking about how the ecology has changed over time and we've developed some schematic sections of how the Donebrook corridor may have looked as it evolved. Here at the top of your screen, you see an image from the 70, 1790s before the Shakers or any settlers came and really developed the land. And we imagine that as a, a wide floodplain and a shallow stream bed um, with a, with a um, a uh, community of native wetland plants throughout and mixed deciduous canopy trees in the forest on either side of the stream corridor. And down below in 1830s, by the Shakers, by the time that Shakers came to begin to settle the Doan Brook, the landscape was completely transformed. And most of those woods were cut down for uh, timber and changed into meadow, farm fields, and pasture, thus greatly decreasing the biodiversity in the Donebrook corridor and beginning a process of erosion of those stream banks. You can see some of what that looked like previously in that little image to the right. Next. And then when the dam was built by the 1860s, the stream valley was again completely transformed and that uh, diversity was further reduced by being um, flooded by the uh, the uh, impoundment and the lake itself. And that began the process of sedimentation that has gone on for the past 150 years of running down and filling up the basin itself and transforming the stream bed even further. And finally, the, the bottom image here is really the condition that we have today where the water is no longer in the lake and you have the exposed sediment there that has been quick, quickly taken over by invasive species and created large monocultures, as I described in the previous diagram. Here we have an image of a Shaker Lake Nature Center, the Shaker Lakes Nature Center. And the reason we bring this up is we wanna just let you know that we are working closely with them already. And we're well aware of the seven distinctive ecologies that they've developed and that are such a resource for the area. And as we think about the evolving park space, um, we're gonna be working carefully to complement these, these different environments and ecologies and build upon them and create new ones to create both most, more diversity for plants and animals, but also greater educational opportunities for everyone coming to this area. And we see them really as a partner in this process. 
Well, we're going to continue to do this environmental research and analysis with our team of scientists and engineers. We're really just at the very beginning of this process, and that will really inform the design as it goes forward. But we thought at this point it was important, even early on here, to begin to imagine what the new spaces might look like, what the character of these spaces might be. In order to do that, we've gathered images from three different distinct types of parks. Uh, we're calling nature parks, stormwater cleansing parks, and passive recreation parks. And we're gonna share these images with you just to get your ideas flowing about what the park spaces might look like. And I just wanna emphasize that in the end, uh, it won't be one or the other, it will be a blend of all three of these different characters that will come together to form the final uh, area and park plan. The first one I'm gonna show you is uh, examples of the nature park. And here the idea is to restore and create as much um, habitat as you can possibly uh, imagine in this space and really have human occupation as light and delicate on the land as possible and moved off to the side to let nature take center stage. An example of this, which I mentioned earlier is Kunamesic Park is a, a great example of a nature park where you have just one place to cross the restored river corridor and appreciate it. And all of the other access is kind of kept to the perimeter and places where you can get a, a view from above like a Kunamesic, that curving walkway, or even this image in the lower left where you're raised above and you can get a better sense of the entire system, but also have a chance to get down in it and, and appreciate and enjoy some of the details, of this type of park. Another way to engage and appreciate a park like this would be a canopy walk. That image in the center, upper center of the screen is from Hardberger Park, the park we just finished in Texas. And then that allows people coming to that park to get right up to the top of the canopy of the trees and see plants and animals that you would never see or be able to appreciate from the ground and give you a really unique experience of that environment. Another way to engage with a park like this can be very simple, like that image in the lower right-hand corner where you just have a mown pathway through a meadow. And that's a kind of engagement path that could change year to year and season to season, depending on what you want to see or management that might have to happen in the park. The next kind of park we're thinking of just as a precedent is this stormwater garden or constructed wetland park. And the essence of this kind of park is that it's dynamic. It may have a series of wet meadows or marshes, which could appear like the image in the upper left-hand corner uh, for much of the year. But after a storm event, they may transform to an image like that pond. The same area that was previously a marsh would now be a body of water, such as that in the lower left-hand corner. In this kind of park, you would want a much larger, more extensive system of boardwalks to allow people to get out on the water and understand and appreciate the processes that are going on to cleanse that water. And they might even involve uh, platforms that can serve as outdoor classrooms. Next. And in this kind of park, you might have the kind of um, channel or spillway you see in the upper left, the channel in your upper left-hand corner, which might allow uh, efficient movement of one area and management of water from one part of the park to the others. And if you had a change in grade, you would want to really celebrate that, like the image in the lower right, make that visible and make that the focus of the experience and the educational opportunities of this type of park. Next. And finally, the Passive Recreation Park um, puts human activity and um, experience really at the center of the design. And we can, these are some of the activities we can imagine going on in the re-envisioned park space such as yoga or bike riding or jogging. Also in the left-hand corner is a bird blind that we worked on at Harburger Park where we worked hand in hand with local artists to create something that allows you to see the birds but it also is an art object in and of itself. And the stormwater garden in the lower right is a, an interactive part of a kind of stormwater fountain feature. Next. Here's some more activities we can imagine happening in the park. Um, and in this type of park, we can imagine that there may be more pavilions or structures and areas of, of lawn for special events, such as that dinner happening there. 
And we want to make sure that it would be used throughout the year. So we'd also be designing places for things like cross-country skiing or maybe even ice loops for people to use throughout the year. I'm going to hand it back over to Matt to talk about some concluding comments and some schedule items. Thanks, Glenn. So just to summarize, um, we are at the very beginning of this process, as we mentioned, and we desire to establish a landscape plan that embodies the visions and aspirations of the community through meetings just like this one. Uh, in just a moment, I'll talk about many more opportunities for us to continue this conversation. In restoring the stream corridors, we want to make sure that we are um, thinking ecologically and restoring species diversity back to the Donebrook corridor, increasing community access and education opportunities, like Glenn mentioned, and working closely in collaboration with area institutions, just like the Nature Center. In managing the waterway sediment, we want to make sure that we're capturing the potential to reuse that material to support unique and vibrant parkland elements that might come at a later date. And in removing the dam, like I showed in some of those earlier photographs, we want to create new grade control elements that celebrate Doan Brook without impounding water. So to continue this conversation, um, I'm going to point out a handful of other upcoming engagement opportunities that we'd love for you to continue to participate in. So this blow up down here is, is kind of an enlargement of the pre-design phase. And on this blow up, you can see we've separated the pre-design into three distinct categories, a discovery phase, which we're in at the moment, an alternatives development phase, which will come after the conclusion of our events this week, and then a refinement phase. And each of these three phases will culminate in a major public forum, just like this one. So here we are today, there'll be another public forum where we come back to you with all the feedback that we got and have inserted those into a series of alternatives for you to review and discuss. And then ultimately in the spring of 2023, we'll come back with a refined plan that we think is the most appropriate plan to bring into the detailed design phase of the project. Along the way, there's going to be multiple opportunities to continue to stay engaged. One of those opportunities is the online survey that we launched today. You'll see a little bit more about how you access that in just a moment. There will be a series of walking tours, which I'll um, explain on a little bit more on in just a second. There'll be a series of pop-up events this fall and in, into the winter where our design team will come out and meet you out in the community imp impromptu uh, to get your candid feedback on how the process is going along the way. And there will likely be other online surveys as we get into beyond the develop alternatives development phase um, and start to hone in on exactly what's most appropriate for uh, the parklands here at Horseshoe Lake. Um, importantly, and, and very soon, is the next opportunity to engage with all of us. That's at the open house on Saturday in the park, August 27th from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. We have a variety of events scheduled for that morning, uh, and I'll just summarize a couple of those for you now. Um, we have a series of tents, themed tents, which will have uh, members of the design team and the client group and other volunteers to help answer any questions you have based on these themes. Um, Glenn will be at the Envisioning the Future Park tent here, in item number one, at the, at the head of the peninsula in the park. Um, I will be with uh, my deputy project manager, Yvonne Valentik from GPD Group in tent number five over here, which is uh, a repeat of the envision Envisioning the Future Park. And here we'll have some activities looking at a lot of those precedent photographs that Glenn um, presented and ask you, you, know, you to react to those uh, as ideas that we could carry forward into the alternatives development phase. Um, there will also be other tents uh, where we'll have some representatives from the design team and client group at this ecology tent at the beach location of the park, uh, where we've opened up a couple of views so that you could see out into the impoundment area and ask some questions about the flora and fauna that exist or pre-existed the lake uh, in the park area. Right in the center of the park, where you can see the pavilions, we'll have an event information center with more information about how you can stay engaged. And near the restrooms, we'll also have a sediment tent, 
which doesn't sound very exciting, but I trust me, it's going to be great. Uh, we'll have a series of 3D models that we have laser cut uh, of our study area, and we'll have uh, Play-Doh and moon sand for families to sculpt that, uh, uh, that sediment to help us understand what the possibilities are for reusing the real sediment in the project site. If you walk down across the boardwalk towards South Park Boulevard, we'll have a river morphology station where Julie Bingham from Avira Science is going to be stationed to point out the challenges and opportunities of restoring those stream corridors from the headwaters down through the impoundment area to the main branch of uh, the north branch of Doan Brook. And then as you come out around uh, South Park Boulevard and walk towards the dam uh, on the pathway, you'll see two more stations, Roy Larrick Station uh, with history and geology. And Roy will be at that tent all morning. Um, and right around lunchtime at noon, Roy will lead uh, a casual tour down to point out some of those features that he mentioned earlier today. And then lastly, we'll have a dam removal tent right here where the emergency breach was constructed. So um, our engineering experts from AECOM, Troy Neparella and others, uh, we'll be there to answer all of your detailed questions about what you're looking at, uh, why it's good or bad, and what the future of that area might look like. So here you can see when you arrive at the park on Saturday, if you're able to join us, uh, we have a series of seven stations uh, and a great uh, group of, of design team members, client group members, and, and volunteers to help answer any of the questions you might have. So. Uh, we would love to hear from you and really hope that we get to see you on Saturday. If you can't make it on Saturday, there's a couple other walking tours that we have scheduled that you'll be able to register for using the link down below at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Dr. Roy Larrick uh, will lead with other design team members a series of themed tours of Doan Brook throughout the reach. The first set of tours, which will occur on Saturday, September 24th, and Sunday, September 25th, uh, are themed Parks Restored, and it's going to highlight a series of recent restoration projects along Doan Brook throughout University Circle near the um, Cleveland Museum of Art MLK Drive across 105th towards the Rockefeller Lagoon. And here you'll be able to see uh, a, a lot of the historic development in, of Doan Brook and attempts at restoring that floodplain back into uh, what was previously channelized sections of the brook. The second themed tour will occur on uh, either Saturday, October 1st or Sunday, October 2nd. The theme of this tour is Gorge Transformed. It's, of course, the Doan Brook Gorge in Ambler Heights. And this will show you a little bit about uh, what looks to be uh, a beautiful piece of, of nature actually has been significantly transformed over the years because of development. And we'll point out some of those features um, and concerns uh, at the Gorge Transformed Tour. And then lastly, in late October, the 22nd and 23rd, we will host a series of tours of the study area. And we've themed this past to future where we'll dive in a little bit more deeply to um, the historical past and the opportunities presented for the future of the park. And again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and, and Jen mentioned at the top, there is an online survey that is now live where we've asked a series of a pretty simple questions about how you use the park today, how you can imagine using the park in the future, and, and a little bit about yourself so that we could understand uh, who we've been able to reach so far and who we need to work harder uh, to reach in future engagement opportunities. And so with that, I'll hand it back over to Jen Elting to um, facilitate a question and answer period with the balance of time we have left. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Matt, Matt, Janet, um, Glenn, everyone here um, for a great presentation. Um, I did have a couple of questions. And for those of you, there were a lot of people that asked me very similar questions. So I will use a little bit of, um, editorial discretion on these just to uh, to try to get it taken care of. Um, one of the questions that came up is a lot of people are really concerned about the, the trees that are there on site right now, um, what we're planning to do with some of the old growth trees, um, 
and also um, what we're going to do with the invasive um, plants that are currently there on site. So what we're looking at to do to remove them in the first place and then possibly sewer district team from a maintenance perspective, what we do to ensure that they don't take the area back over. So I'll do the first one with the trees for the Stimson team. And then um, if the, the sewer district team can talk a little bit about maintenance, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, I think one of the things when we um, arrived on site uh, as we were engaged to begin this process, we were really struck by the great stand of, of majestic trees throughout the project site, both in the downstream area around, you know, downstream of, of the dam near Lee Road, but all the way up through the, um, the park. Uh, and certainly we um, are going to work very hard to make sure that we protect that great stand of trees. I think some of the challenges that we're finding is the understory, the ground cover and shrub layers below that are where a lot of the invasive material is. And so um, I might pass it over to Glenn just to add a little bit to this, and, and then we'll probably hand it over to Matt Sharver from the district. Thanks, Matt. You know, um, as Matt said, we were really struck by how beautiful and majestic these trees were and um, just the variety. There's a, a lot of hickories in there. There's a few tulip trees along with these oaks, uh, big cottonwoods and big areas of black willow throughout the area. Some of the problem, as, as Matt mentioned, really is the understory and that, that um, privet has come in and uh, buckthorn and really invaded large areas of the understory. And the good news is that much of that has happened in areas where our restoration process will be, um, will be focusing its attention and its energies to remove those invasive plants. And to create some of the stream restoration, there's, there's going to be some substantial earth movement and sediment removal. And that is some of the, the best ways to begin to remove invasives um, in this process. So I, I think there's the good news is there's investment and um, effort focused currently on those areas where the invasives are um, the worst and they're the biggest monocultures that are going to be addressed in the process of stream restoration. And just to reinforce what Matt said, the, ma the majestic trees that are there now are a great asset, not only in the park, but throughout the entire area. In the park, you have wonderful trees, and we really want to highlight the similar native trees throughout the entire area. And then Matt or Janet, are either of you able to talk about the maintenance um, with dealing with invasives in the future? Yeah, sure, Jen. Uh, just to build on Matt and, and Glenn's response there. So certainly we're committed to the to the trees that are at the site to the uh, to the extent practicable. We are going to have a lot of earth moving activity there to deal with the sediment. And so that just speaks to the complexity of this, this project and the fact that we're at the beginning stages here and there are still a lot of unknowns, a lot of variables that, that we'll have to go through a process to understand the best way to address those. Things. But in terms of invasive species, it's always a challenge. Um, we uh, try to address those uh, in a methodical, strategic way. Um, some of these invasives that we're going to encounter, we know what's there now, uh, are quite aggressive. So we will have to put together a plan of attack um, that will probably uh, require us to be proactive before uh, construction starts to see if we can try to beat back some of those invasives. We're already having discussions about that now. And then as far as the commitment long-term, uh, the, the project that the district funds in terms of the restoration of the corridors, uh, the North Branch and the Middle Branch, uh, we want to protect that investment um, and invasive species control will be a part of that. Now will we be able to address every single invasive and, and every single invasive that grows there individually? Not likely, but we will have a game plan to try to control them to the best of our ability to, again, to protect the investment and, and make it aesthetically pleasing um, and, and safe uh, for the community. Thank you very much. And the next question for the group is actually for Dr. Larrick. Um, and somebody would like to know if the informal walking paths that are west of the dam, possibly east, currently follow the old mill race. 
So can you currently follow the old mill race when you're walking yes. on the informal paths? Yes, the mill race is easy to follow because it is a constructed berm. And for most of the 800 feet, uh, there is the depression of the mill race. It looks like a stream bed that's basically dry. And then it rises up on the stream side, two, three, four feet. And then you can walk, that's the berm you can walk several hundred feet on. And then it, that drops quickly down to the stream. So yes, the mill race is currently walkable. Uh, it can be a little difficult. We can do that on Saturday. If, if the question asker appears on Saturday, uh, we will take a, a walk down to the mill race and see that it's there. It's a wonderful asset. It does have a few problems. Uh, invasive species is one. Uh, the big problem is erosion. And uh, the uh, erosion, the, the mill race could be conserved uh, while the stream is being restored downstream of the dam. And as you know, there is no plan yet. But uh, as the plan comes uh, to restore the stream through the lake bed and down toward Lee Road, then that's the time that erosion issues for the mill race can be addressed. Come on Saturday, we'll walk the mill race. Thank you so much. I'm sure you'll be a very popular uh, station at the event. I think a lot of people are going to want to see that. Um, I have another question for the design team. Um, and I'll kind of toss a couple different things at you. The first one is, do you have any estimate on how wide the north branch and the middle branch of Donebrook will be when it's restored? And the second question is, how do you deal with the altitude drop? from the eastern end of the study area to um, the current uh, current spillway location. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, I'll start by, by noting that um, we are developing um, a series of models of the hydrology of, of the whole corridor as it passes through Horseshoe Lake Park. And I'm gonna call on um, uh, Julie Bingham, our stream restoration leader to talk a little bit more technically about um, about the process, but we will, um, we're working uh, to understand the flows that are gonna come through the site first. That's gonna establish the general width of the stream bed itself and, and the floodplain on either side. And Julie, you're probably better equipped to kind of answer the second part of that question about how we manage the grade change vertically across the corridor. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've got a lot of fall. I mean, you're over between 25 and 30 feet. Uh, and so we're gonna be looking at alternatives to get through the dam, but some of that grade might continue in the downstream direction. Uh, below the dam, you know, we're looking at, you know, those bank heights down there are seven feet and that's an unnatural bank height. Um, you know, that, that, that creek down there has incised some detached from the available floodplain there. So that's a potential alternative. Uh, so if you're, if you're raising in the downstream end, but also, you know, raising in, in that way, you're able to, uh, transition the grade. We, we'd we like to try to maintain the grades as low as possible from an energy perspective um, that reduces risk, it reduces, um, you know, the flow velocities, uh, but also in some of the previous slides, there might be opportunities for some of those, uh, you know, more concentrated, uh, what we call grade controls or uh, cascade type features, waterfalls, things like that could help um, deal with some of that gradient in different places upstream of the current dam location. Thank you. And I have um, a question probably for Frank Greenland, but Matt could Matt or Janet could definitely address this as well. Um, there are quite a few questions in the Q&A about the work that went into our recommendation, um, specifically if you can talk a little bit about the stormwater master plan that we did for this area and some of the factors that went into um, our recommendation for this project. Well, I'll start it off and then Matt or Janet can add into to whatever I say. One of the most important projects in my opinion, that the district's undertaken under its regional stormwater management program is the execution of what we call stormwater master plans across the service area. And we did them in four broad quadrants of our entire service area, including what we called 
the Lake Erie tributaries, uh, Chagrin River and Lake Erie tributary area that included Doan Brook and other streams, Euclid Creek, Green Creek, others. Uh, the investment in that master plan was approximately $10 million. And these master plans are very detailed analyses of not only the stream network, but the problems within the stream network. We walked every inch of those streams, did appropriate surveys, flow monitored the streams, established a series of stream gauges across the service area to understand what, how does the stream react to rainfall. We have rainfall gauges across this service area to understand how much rainfall fell. So there's a lot of science behind the hydraulics of Doan Brook. How does Doan Brook react? And what are the problem areas and impediments that cause issues, either water quality issues, erosion issues, flooding issues of different types? So it was a very detailed analysis. Then when we look at problem areas, and we discuss problem areas with stakeholders, and obviously the Horseshoe Lake, Lower Lake, there's, there's our issues. And there are issues along the entire Dome Brook watershed corridor. From head to toe, uh, University Circle floods, we know that. And there are causes for that and proposed solutions. Martin Luther King floods routinely on its way to Lake Erie. There are causes for that proposed solution. Same thing at Lower Lake and Horseshoe Lake. So during the planning process, there were a number of alternatives that were run at both Lower Lake and Shaker Lake to determine what could we do to alleviate flooding concerns at different areas of the system. So there were early analyses done to hone in on four key alternatives. And they are outlined in, in, in the reports. And our, our focus was what's best, not just risk, not just cost, not just environment, not just long-term maintenance, those issues, the collective whole. So we honed in on four key alternatives in the Downbrook watershed for both Lower Lake and Shaker Lake and, and Horseshoe Lake, the dams. And when we looked at that situation, it was evident to us, and Janet talked about this early, the positioning of Lower Lake and other capabilities was a, was a point of control that did indeed provide flood control benefits. When we layered an additional dam at Horseshoe Lake on top of that recommendation, we saw no added benefit. And our, when we looked at benefit, it was alleviation of flood inundation, flooded properties, buildings or roads in different locations. Now we would like to get to a hundred year level of protection across this area, across the whole service area. We're not gonna get there everywhere, but we strive to get as far as we can. We know there are issues with the culvert and university circle and we are investigating solutions to increase culvert capacity. But we're not gonna get to a hundred year there. That's my prediction. I don't think we're gonna get there, but we're gonna strive to raise that level of service. So there was detailed analyses and there was discussion, and we discussed this with at several meetings, Zoom meetings, community center meetings, other meetings with the councils. We do not own the dams. We work with the communities to deal with the issues of the dams. So it was a very comprehensive study that led us to this, this, this solution. And I, I just want to remind everyone, we're at the beginning now. A decision has been made. Our recommendation has been made. The councils have acted. And we're in the pre-design phase. So quite good questions about how we're gonna manage grade, what's it gonna look like, what's the floodplain width are all unanswered questions right now, but all ripe for opportunity as we try to restore this and make this a great asset for the community. I don't know, Matt, Janet, if there's anything else you wanna add. No, I think you covered everything, Frank. There are the presentations that we gave um, online at NEORSD. Um, so please look those up if you have any further questions. I do want to say there is no predisposed decision on what that corridor is going to look like. And with that grade, there's opportunities. Certainly there's a dry weather profile and there's a lot of flow in wet weather. So how are we going to manage that flow? Will there be waterfalls, wetlands, those kind of things? All unanswered questions but we welcome your opinions 
on what you'd like to see as we go forward. And this discussion is only beginning, it will continue. All right, and there is another question um, in the Q&A asking um, about, um, oh my gosh, I just lost it, I'm so sorry. Um, asking about the north and middle branches of, um, of Dome Brook, which is what this project impacts, but then where that the flows from there meet the lower branch of Dome Brook and how that impacts um, the stormwater flows through the nature center. Matt Sharver, do you want to do you want to um, begin the answer to that question? Yeah, we can, Matt. I don't know if you can pull up the presentation again and, and show everyone a, a, a watershed map. I think that'll help orient folks to understand how the north branch, the middle branch come together and then the lower branch comes in downstream. Yep, I could do that. Just orient one... themselves to the to the four lakes and the Shaker Lakes. Yep, just one second. But it, it is important to understand, and, and one of the concerns uh, for the Horseshoe Lake situation is the sediment. And, and Glenn covered this extensively uh, about the amount of sediment that's collected uh, in Horseshoe Lake over the decades. And so, you know, with the, the dam being uh, in a, a failing state, uh, you know, we, we've got to move forward. Uh, because we would not want to have an event where the dam were to, to have a catastrophic failure and we would allow that sediment to, uh, to move downstream. Uh, that would wreak more havoc in the watershed um, unnecessarily. So you can see here on, on the image that Matt's pulled up um, the differentiation between the different uh, watershed areas of the north and the middle branch and then the lower branch uh, to the south, um, more position than Shaker Heights, uh, picks up uh, Green and Marshall Lake, and then comes in just uh, upstream of Lower Lake. And if you can follow Matt's cursor there, uh, you can see that Low Lower Lake is positioned uh, in that control point location, which is really important um, from a, a flood control benefit standpoint. That's why uh, you know, the sewer district is committed to the investment um, to replace uh, Lower Lake Dam because it does provide flood control benefit downstream, again, mainly due to its position in the watershed. Um, so that, that's an important uh, factor. And while you have this up, let's keep this up for a minute because there are a couple of questions um, wanting to know how the um, horseshoe drainage area and lower drainage area impacts or causes flooding in University Circle and what are some other factors um, that, we're, that we are looking at in order to help mitigate that flooding in the University Circle area. Is that a question? I think it's just there's a couple people who are wanting to know um how how this project can help the flooding in university circle let me rephrase that a little bit okay i'll i'll take a, a stab at this the flooding in university circle the flooding along mlk the flooding downstream of the dams you know the, the driver in flooding locally not just at this site locally and nationally is a combination of of changing rainfall patterns and impervious cover. Own Brook has a high percentage of impervious surface, very high percentage. So we are generating a lot of water, certainly a lot more water than you know, when these dams were constructed. So impervious surface and the amount of drainage getting to the streams are beating up the streams. This is what is causing erosion, filling lakes with sediment, uh, and causing flooding downstream. Um, our study, and we talked about this, the master plan looked into this. What is the best combination of alternatives to alleviate flooding concerns in different parts of this system, the Donebrook watershed? Uh, our recommendation was to reconstruct Lower Lake to maximize the flood control benefits that it provides. Uh, 
seeing a lack of flood control benefits, our recommendation was not to reconstruct the Horseshoe Lake Dam. Down in University Circle, there's an analysis of culvert capacity taking place to see if we can augment culvert capacity to increase the level of service. And there are other recommendations along MLK and other areas to determine, can we do things to further prevent flooding across the Donebrook watershed? And sometimes solutions are implementable and sometimes there's not enough land to implement the solution, but we continue to look at that. We did a project early during the master plan to remove significant um, debris that existed in the university circle culvert. And in our estimation, we were able to take that culvert capacity from a two year level of service to 10. That's a pretty big jump at a pretty reasonable cost. All the other jumps up to 25 year level of service and beyond come at significant costs, but we have active projects looking at how do we augment culvert capacity and what do we do along MLK? Horseshoe Lake is part of the process, so is Lower Lake to get that best combination of alternatives put together and constructed to do the best we can for the watershed. All right, Frank, and I'm gonna keep you, uh, keep you on the hot seat right now. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, there are a few questions in here about um, the birding population here in Northeast Ohio, and I know that you are an avid, avid birder, um, so that's definitely a question for you. But um, the, the types of um, birds that, that we may expect in the area and what considerations we are taking, um, taking um, th that we are addressing as we design this project. And I am an active birder. And, yes, yes, you are. And, you know, this is a, a good discussion. Uh, I want to start it by saying we don't have a final solution on the, on the book, so we don't know about what loss of diversity we're going to suffer. Nor do we know what gain in diversity we could achieve, okay? I don't know how the grade control is gonna work for wet weather flow management at Horseshoe Lake. I don't know. So I don't know what the balance, you know, duck species, we're gonna lose all the ducks. I'm not convinced of that. The question is, will you, you know, there's dabblers and there's divers. Divers need more water, dabblers don't. So what is, you know, the final product will dictate, well, we may lose certain diving ducks, but creation of additional habitats that don't exist on a lake footprint also create opportunities for introduction of new bird species to the footprint. When we're going from six acres to 60, that's pretty big space. Now, when the lake was drained, uh, under ODNR orders, created mud flats that, that attracted shorebirds. Well, there's no shorebird habitat in Northeast Ohio, very little, and all of a sudden shorebirds. There's mud, now we see shorebirds. So it's an example of how changes in habitat can attract different species. So I don't know the final verdict, but creation of a great mix of wet Speed, I mean, wetland habitats and other park mixes, whether it's plantings, trees, whatever, creates plenty of opportunities to introduce more species. So we'll see. We don't have a final alternative recommended for this site. And we will see, you know, to maximize the attraction so that we maintain a good level of diversity, not just for fish species, but for other you know, ecological aquatic species as well. So we will see, but I understand the issue and I think there will be a trading that could happen. That doesn't mean a loss on the whole. Thank you, Frank. And with that, I would like to thank everybody who took time out of their evening to join us on the Zoom webinar. As you do know, um, tonight's uh, presentation, it was recorded. We will get it posted um, to our main um, project page at NEO 
rsd.org slash Donebrook um, just as soon as we can. Um, we will also be out at Horseshoe Lake Park to talk with each and every one of you. So please come out, talk to us about the project. As Matt mentioned before, we have some great some great stations available where you can share your ideas you can learn more about sediment and streams and how they behave um, there were a lot of bird questions from folks and um, we do have an ornithologist who will be there as well as um, a team from our water quality team here at the district to talk about um, fish and macroinvertebrate uh, biodiversity and we have dam removal experts dr um, roy larrick with bluestone he will be he will be there to answer questions about his history geology he'll take a couple of um, short hikes with folks that day so please come out to Horseshoe Lake Park Saturday um, August 27th from 10 30 a.m until 1 p.m so thank you again if you have any questions um, please send them our way at ask us at neorsd.org I did try to get to as many questions as I could this evening so thank you for your patience as I worked through as many of them as I could and um, we hope to see you on Saturday thank you very much